Hi everybody, welcome back, and if this is your first time, welcome. My name's Max Adad, and today I'd like to talk about how I'm a Nigerian prince, and my brother-in-law would like to give me $15 million. He's just a nice guy like that. But I don't feel safe having that much money in my country. So I would like to transfer $15 million to you. And when I move to America, I would like half of that money back. And you can keep the other half for the amazing favor that you did me. Thank you, sir or madam. Now, the only hang up, the only problem is that in order to transfer the funds to you, I mean, you know how banks are, I need $10,000. I know, I know, I know. Where am I going to get $10,000? I just, you know how banks are when you're, you know, like a really big customer and you have a lot of money stored with them. So they try to nickel and dime you to inconvenience you. It, 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 you get it. So please send me $10,000 to this routing number and I will send you 15 million and nothing bad will happen to you. Thank you, sir or madam. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Now, this is not a weird topic so much. The way that I thought of it is kind of odd. <laughs> Uh, it's two-parted. One, I thought about a treatment that was recommended to me by a therapist, treatment for addiction, for those of you that weren't with me on that. Treatment for addiction that was recommended to me by a therapist that was basically voodoo magic with vitamins, and it didn't work, big surprise, but we were a desperate family at the time, so we went for it and we, we got ripped off. And the other part of me thinking I should talk about this is I play a video game. In fact, I play many video games, and this is not a shameless plug for my twitch.tv slash idolife TTV stream channel network webpage. It's, uh, it's just a game that I play. Long story short, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. There's a safe, there's a bunch of safe places you can be, and there's some dangerous places you can be. And some of those dangerous places are dangerous, not because of monsters, oh, but because of other players. And when other players kill you in those dangerous places, they get all your stuff or they get most of your stuff. And there are ways to even really get all of it. Uh, and this game, it just so happens that it takes literally like a year and a half, especially if you're a new player to get wealthy in this game, uh, to get, you know, really good equipment gear. Heh. And so losing all that stuff, it feels I mean, it's, it is, it's a bad loss. It's upsetting. It's really, really upsetting. I didn't get, I didn't lose my stuff. Please. I'm a pro, but people all the time, there will, there will be a player in the dangerous area luring these wealthy players into the dangerous area and then kill them and then take their stuff. And the way that they do it is something like, hi, I'm a Nigerian prince and I want to give you free money, which guys, it's not a thing. It's not a thing in a video game. And it's not a thing in your, when you get an email <laughs> and it's not really a thing with treatment. Now it wasn't free money when I got this treatment. What it was is I had been seeing this therapist and I've mentioned them before. I'm not going to name a name. It doesn't matter. They were emotionally comforting to me in my younger years, but they really never helped me. Honestly, they just made me feel better. And I don't know that that, that me feeling better was a good thing. <laughs> I don't think I should have felt better. I think I needed to see the truth. Um, but, but this person, this therapist recommended this treatment and it was after I'd had a really bad overdose. I'd been sober for a while, had a really bad overdose. The one I've mentioned before was hospitalized for five days or, or more. I can't remember. Um, and the treatment was go to this place literally at like a strip center uh and 
sit in a like uh, my point is it was like used to be a real you know real estate office and then this this doctor rents it out sets up a few chairs and then you go and sit in those chairs for eight to 12 hours a day with an iv in your arm and they're just pumping you full of niacin and like vitamin b and the theory how it was proposed to me and my family is that that niacin will flush out your your body and your brain so that any any chemicals you know any like narcotics that are stored in your in your body from all the years of drug abuse that make it difficult even after you're sober to stay sober because you know like cocaine is stored in the fat cells in your brain so you know you get sober and then six months later all of a sudden you taste cocaine that's because cocaine is you know being cleaned out of your system finally but it makes you crave it so my nose is dripping so not because of the cocaine that was poor timing uh, you know, go get this niacin flush and it'll clean all that out. So you never have to go through that. So basically the point is you'll still have to get sober. It'll be difficult, um, but it'll be much easier, you know, and there were advertisements on their website of, you know, like some, some heroin addict who's like, yeah, I went through it and I didn't even go through withdrawal. I didn't have to detox at all. It was just, I go in, they flush me out. Oh, I felt so good. I've never felt this good doctor. Thank you. Not a paid actor. And that would have not been convincing. But my therapist also was proposing that this was a good idea. Same therapist who said I needed $28,000 rehab where we climbed mountains. Don't get me wrong. The mountains were fun. And so was capture the flag and baseball. But baseball never kept me sober. And neither did the mountains. And neither did the niacin flush, which cost $10,000 minimum. It actually ended up being more than that. And they could never give me actual answers too, because it's like, wait a second. So how does the niacin know what chemicals to flush out? But like, I'm on antidepressants and so like, so does it, does it like show up? And it's like, oh, that's an antidepressant Move, moving along. Sorry, sorry. Antidepressant didn't mean to disturb you. And then it flushes out heroin residuals i don't get it and they could never answer that question what they could tell me though is because i was smoking cigarettes that's why the treatment didn't work because the niacin gets really emotional and it feels helpless you know when it sees that it's trying it's i'm working as hard as i can and and you know i'm here all day and you come home and you want me to make you a sandwich and it's cleaning out the the drugs and then you smoke a cigarette and you bring more nicotine in and it's just like i just can't do my job they always presented it like the niacin and this was after we paid no refunds okay this wasn't before if this was before my family and i would have laughed at them this is stupid you're a, you're either a fool who has convinced himself that this works or you are a snake oil salesman <laughs> but this was after we paid so we're just hoping you know we were hoping we were hoping for a solution my parents didn't want me to die i didn't really want to die i might have told you i did but i didn't and i didn't want to relapse anymore i was i had been sick of relapsing thank you david david boy ziggy stardust same guy don't, don't tell him I told you. Um, I had been sick of relapsing for years. I didn't, it wasn't a party. Uh, addiction had stopped being a fun thing. Not addiction, but like drugs were, had not been fun for a long time. But we just were desperate. And so we fell for it. And it didn't work. And it was a waste of money. And that was the last time I went to that therapist. Uh... I haven't followed up on that business. I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I don't know if I will. I shouldn't because it'll make me it'll make me angry, and I might send them a, a nasty email. Wouldn't that be a shame? Uh, so, why am I telling you this? Because I am a Nigerian prince. No, because when you're desperate, okay, whether you've been depressed for 15 years or depressed for two months and it just seems like it'll never end or you, you're an addict and you can't figure out how to really like get sober and stay that way. You could probably get sober, but it can't stay that way. Or you're anxious all the time or you're in a miserable job and somebody, you know, somebody makes you a job offer. It's, it sounds too good to be true. When you're in a position of hurt and you're feeling lost and you get to the point where you don't have any answers anymore, 
you're out of answers, right? I was out of answers. I don't know anymore. I have thought that I had it beat uh, about a thousand times now, and I'm just out of answers. And that was actually when I gave up. That was when I just said, I'm just gonna use until I die. And I did, and then I finally got sober one more time, and then I robbed the pharmacy, and so I just, I was out of answers. And somebody presented us with something that sounded too good to be true. They presented us with some silver bullet, some magic that would fix me, and it didn't. And when you're in that kind of position where you have no more answers, you are looking for someone that does have some answers or the answer, even better. And it puts you in a position to get hurt by people who are either ignorant and, you know, tricking themselves and in turn tricking you or people that are maliciously taking money from people that are upset. Uh, televangelists, you know, I don't mean, this isn't even a religious thing, but you could watch, there's plenty of documentaries uh, filmed by the very people that used to televangelize saying, yeah, it was a trick. We'd go up there and I was a plant in the audience and they would touch my head and I would fall over like it was a miracle and then people would donate money. It was a trick. You know, uh, is there a televangelist out there that is actually performing miracles? I don't think so. But if you do, that's okay. My point is people that are desperate and they want help, you show up to some sermon and you're sick and you don't want to pass away. I can cure you with a $1,000 donation to the church. <laughs> I believe God will give me the power to cure you with a $10,000 donation to my pocket. I believe this you know, IV drip full of niacin and vitamin B will fix you. With $28,000, three mountains, two games of softball and one game of capture the flag, this rehab will cure you. Uh, and I would hate it if you guys were in the position that you are at the bottom of the barrel and someone is preying on you. Now, basically like let's say you're in that position and somehow this video helps you you're able to protect yourself from someone taking advantage of you and now you're just where you were though you're just back to not having answers what can i tell you in that position the reason i pause for so long is because that's a difficult question and i don't plan these things before i record them <laughs> if let me tell you my experience When I got to the point in addiction where it, I had gone to prison, okay? Like I had not only lost everything multiple times, but now I was in the, the worst circumstance I had ever been in. And it would be that way for a long period of time. I would be trapped in this place. The only thing that I had that really mattered I mean, I had my family and I had, you know, the girlfriend who I loved and I had my pets and I had, you know, but I didn't really, you know, like they were at the end of a phone. They were maybe in a visit every two weeks. Uh, you know, my parents were uh, for sure, but sometimes, they, you know, sometimes the prison wouldn't let them. Um, the only thing I really had was the promise that I had made to myself to stay sober. And because of that, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but it almost became a non-issue because I couldn't give that away and still be myself. There, I could not entertain the idea of Max Haddad having a future and give away that promise I had made to myself. So when temptation arise, which to be honest, was few and far between, even in prison, because the drugs people do there are like garbage drugs that make people literally shit their pants, strip nude and fight each other, like weren't very appealing, but still nicotine addict. And there was nicotine and like, there was stuff that I could very well have partaken in. And there was meth and heroin. It just wasn't as prevalent as other stuff. But, uh, when temptation arose, you know, even if the person was like, I'll give you $10 of this for $1, you, 
you know, because I like you. And it wasn't too good to be true. It was a real thing. It wasn't a dollar that I was paying. I was paying my whole future. I was paying every little tiny bit of Max Haddad that was left. Um, and I wasn't willing to do that. So how do you put yourself in a position that, well, let me say this. <clears throat> if you've reached the bottom of the barrel, and this is not me saying you have to reach your bottom. That's not, I, we, that'll be a different video. I might've already made it. I can't remember. <laughs> I'll have to look. Uh, when you're at the bottom of the barrel, what I mean is when you are just miserable, you know, inconsolably, awfully, terribly, tremendously upset with the state of yourself in your life. And it feels like there is no way you'll ever beat the thing that you're facing. I don't think that I need to give you any tips and tricks to feel as though you have nothing more important than besting this problem because I assume you already feel that way or you wouldn't really be at that, you know, destitute, emotionally destitute state or whatever. But let's say that there's some framework I can provide you to make it easier. I would say simplifying my life was the, the, the most helpful thing I did for me to stay sober and, and stay sober. I simplified my life. And what I mean is I got rid of everything and everyone that complicated it and made it more difficult emotionally, physically, financially, all of it. I quit a job that I hated. I got rid of a girl that made me miserable, even though I loved her. I dropped friends and I didn't just stop talking to them. I told them tactfully why, but I dropped them. Uh, you know, when it comes to my brother and his stresses right now that I've mentioned before and how we don't get along uh, because of his, his struggle, I am so happy that that drama is not my life. As much as I care about him and want him to be well, I don't allow those things in. And the reason I don't allow them in is because when I was in that point of, a, of, of emotional destitution, that's probably not a word, I got rid of all those things and I realized the benefit of it. And I'm hoping that if you feel like you have nothing left, that you are willing to drop some things, you know? Like, here's a little bit of a paradox, I guess. I was ruining my life, my health, the life of my family, uh, overdosing, getting arrested. Um, but I never missed a phone call from my girlfriend. You know, like, that, that I won't do. I'm a good guy. It's like, hi, miss a call from your girlfriend, please. Worry about what's actually important, please. If you're showing up to work every day, but you're not showing up for yourself, it doesn't matter. You're not winning until you show up for you. I just, I see myself and lots of people who are, it just feels like they're focusing on the wrong things. And I think they're doing that because it feels like this is what I can control. I can't figure out this problem, can't seem to solve it. So I'm just going to do this really well. And if you, if anything tries to wrest control out of their hands, they react strongly because you're not just threatening that thing. You're putting them in a position where they have to focus on this other thing. I think that's where a lot of the drama came in between my brother and I. When I wasn't able to play video games with him because I had actual work to do, he took it way more seriously than it needed to be because if I wasn't around to distract him, he was stuck with himself. Uh, and that's sad. It sucks. Uh, and I, I, I'm getting off topic. So if you're in a position where you feel like you've reached the end of your rope, uh, I think simplifying, but I don't think you really need my help when it comes to understanding how grave it is. 
but just don't take anybody up on magic because there's been no magic in regards to my sobriety and everybody's different for sure. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm not like not a spiritual person. I mean, I spent years and years praying. I practiced Buddhism for, for a while, uh, meditating constantly, all that stuff. And I still like meditating. Uh, and I used to, to pray to God all the time morning and night, but all throughout the day too, please help me stay sober. And when I first stopped, it was because I was angry. And now I, I still will pray at times, but I don't give God credit for my sobriety. Uh, I don't know if that's surprising or, or not, or if it will offend somebody. I don't think it should, but maybe it will. I don't know. Uh, it's not like a cool edgy thing. I'm just saying, I don't give God any credit for my sobriety because he sheer it didn't do it. <laughs> I did it. There's plenty of stuff that I can't explain plenty of stuff that I don't know how it came to be. And I'm not saying God did it. I'm just saying I certainly didn't. Uh, but this one, that's all me, motherfucker. <laughs> I did this and I'm not giving credit to anybody. I will say thank you for the help you've provided to me. Like my, with my wonderful parents and siblings, you know, I could name everybody all over again, but I did this. So there's no magic out there for you. There's, there's no, wow, it's too good to be true, but it's true. There's just none when it comes to solving the hardest problem that you will ever solve in your life. If you are at the, um, the place I'm talking about and you know, if you know, <laughs> you know, if you are, if you are, this is the hardest thing you will ever do. And there's going to be more tragedy after it. Trauma, probably. Like awful stuff's going to happen. People you love will pass away. But this is your challenge. The other stuff you can share with other people. You will grieve. You will, you know, sob. It will be awful. But that you will get through just by existing. Uh, and there's more to it than that. I'm not trying to minimize someone's grief. I'm just saying... What am I saying? <laughs> I'm saying this, you can't just sit and think. That's certainly part of it, but this is your challenge and there's no magic. And I don't, and I don't think anyone else has a solution for you. You do. There is 100%, I have zero doubt that there is a solution for you to stay sober or to be happy or to to be more serene and less anxious or to get out of that job that is literally making you want to kill yourself or that relationship that is doing the same thing. There is a solution for you, but no one else has it. And if you don't do it, it will not ever resolve ever. And it is going to look like hell. <laughs> it is going to be all the things that you don't want to do. Some of the things that you want to do, but it's going to be all the things that you don't want to do. All the people you don't want to say goodbye to all the places you never want to realize you'll never be again. All of the habits that have comforted you and snuggled you to sleep. All of that has to be on the table of things that you're willing to get rid of. I'm not saying you have to change everything. That's what AA told me. I did not have to change everything, not even close to it, but I had to be willing to change everything. And you have to be, I couldn't have gotten sober if I was in that relationship I was in. And I couldn't have gotten sober if I was in any of the relationships I've been in, except for maybe one of them, like my first girlfriend, maybe because we were kids and it wasn't so toxic. Uh, but other than that, like, you know, I was basically just repeating a pattern. I am talking way too much. I was just repeating a pattern. I couldn't have. So that relationship had to be something that I would let go if I needed to. I thought about it and I'll end with this. I'm so sorry that this is so long <laughs> and I, off topic. 
I was walking Nolly yesterday, who you might hear behind the computer chewing a bone, uh, and help me, David. I was thinking about my weight, my problems with food, which have been going well lately. But I was thinking about my weight, my problems with food, and my sobriety. Sometimes I play these either like mental exercises, I guess. I think it's just me like, you know, like being bored and not being comfortable with silence. So I like play these games in my head. But it was like, if I, if I, so the, the, I would get a six pack, I'd be in the best shape of my life and I would stay that way and all of my eating habits would change. But, but in order to do that, I would have to relapse and I could get sober again. It wouldn't be that I would, you know, have to be, you could, you would have to be a using addict for the rest of your life, but you would have that, you know, healthy body and healthy eating habits or, and the, or what if the only way to stay sober was to never get in shape? To, own, to keep gaining weight until you die. And I was like, would I be, would I be willing to relapse even if it was just like a six month, just like a six month thing to, to get in shape? And there is no fucking way. Even if I knew, even if you could promise me after that relapse, you will get sober again. Your family will forgive you again. Your dog will forgive you. You're not going to lose anything permanently. And it's all going to get back exactly to how it is now. If you could guarantee me that, there is no fucking way I would visit that emotional torture again. Even if you could sign a contract that everything will be back as is in six months at the longest. There's no fucking way. And if the only way for me to stay sober would be to just never get in shape, I would gladly. I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't be thrilled, okay, if I just couldn't ever feel good in my body again, but I would be willing to do that because I'm not willing to go back there. Why am I telling you that? Because I think it's, and it's not because I'm awesome and smart and great. I think it's an example of how much I cared about it. That's all. It was just my ability to care about it. And I don't have the ability to care about it more than you do or someone else does. Whatever your struggle is, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that is an example of my, uh, something that I care about so much, you know, like finally besting this binge eating, this, you know, overindulgence, this misery that I have sometimes when I've eaten too much, finally besting that I would quit on that altogether to protect myself from a relapse. And again, it's just a game in my head. So it's not like I can't even, you know, I can't outline for you what that would even look like because that wouldn't, I don't think that would ever happen. But everything has to be on the table. There's no magic. And you have to be willing to, to do basically anything. Yeah. Have a good day. Talk to you soon. Bye.